What's up, friends? This is your host, Dan Giffen. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you haven't subscribed to the newsletter yet, you need to do that right now. Uh, if you go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter, then we'll send you updates with upcoming webinars we have with myself and other certified trainers. I'm going to be doing a lot more of them, teaching different skills. We've got one coming up on how to better organize your Ableton project folder and files and sample library. Um, anything from that to all kinds of other topics with certified trainers. Um, check it out, liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. We'll let you know when upcoming webinars are happening. And you can also um, choose exactly what kind of content, video tutorials, and topics that you are interested in that we can send you interesting stuff based on your interest. So check it out, liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. And now for today's podcast with Aaron Barra. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Giffen. Today, we have a special guest with us, Erin Barra. She is a music technologist, a songwriter, and a professor at Boston's Berklee College of Music. She's also the founder and director of Beats by Girls, which is an educational group training young female artists in music production. She does a lot of other really cool things. Thanks, Erin, for being on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, this would be a good time. Well, I first ran into you at GearFest, and that was in <laughs> Fort Wayne, and you did a presentation using the push to, and you talked about a little bit of your life setup with your vocals and things in Ableton, thought it was really cool. The Ableton family was there, and uh, it was an amazing conference. I thought you did an awesome job presenting, and I was like, hey, I'd love to have her on the podcast. And fast forward like a year and a half, and here we are. So that was GearFest 2018? Yes. Or 2017? That, that would have been 18, and, so not even a year, really. Okay. So I think that was the year I did that Shaka Khan thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It was cool. I remember. Um, oh, glad you liked it. Yeah. <laughs> GearFest. I've, I've met so many random people that have like made a huge difference in my life at that festival. <laughs> yeah, that was my first year going, and... And it was free and who doesn't like free? So it was a good way to meet a lot of other artists and distribution companies for gear of all sorts. Hence the name gear fest. Yeah. They, but they put on an awesome festival. That's like super different from Nam or any of the other ones. It's actually like about the users and yeah. consumers. And I like that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about you. So tell us about your musical journey. How did you get started producing music? I know you, are an educator, a performer, you're your own artist, you're a, a songwriter. Tell us how you got started with music and kind of how that led you to using Ableton today and where you're at. Uh, sure. It's a long story, but I'm going to condense it down. You got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> it's so long. Um, I, my parents put me in like a music preschool and I had always been playing music. I think my dad is a, he places speakers for a living. So like really, really expensive, like $30,000 pair of speakers. They're, they're like 900 pounds each. And so once you put them down, like they don't move because they, they weigh 900 pounds each. Wow. Um, and I think that he always wanted to actually be a musician, but um, his parents wanted him to be like a physicist, math engineer person <laughs> instead. So he did that. And um, so I think that's honestly why I was put into music and sort of like kept there for so long as a child. But I, I you know, I studied classically at a university, like a preparatory division at a university until I went to Berkeley. So I would, I'd always honestly been playing since I was like the age of four, but it was more just piano driven. And I got into composition like late in high school, I went to Berkeley and I got a songwriting and piano performance degree and then was pursuing a career as a singer songwriter for years and kind of got into tech just out of sheer necessity because I couldn't afford to pay somebody to make records for me all the time. It was like right on the cusp between like everybody having a home studio and like not everybody had laptops back then. It wasn't like as easy as saying like, only go to my home studio and do this. This is like, you know, yeah. 50, 15 years ago. Yeah. So yeah, I just one day I was like, you know what? I'm going to figure this shit out myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, with the help of some key individuals who let me like shadow and learn and 
the internet, taught myself how to do what I needed to do. And that was more on the production side. So I was starting by using Pro Tools and really getting my hands on a lot of the editing process and some just like basic mixing processes. And then, you know, maybe in 2010, I'm like, my career had gotten to a place where we needed to be touring. Again, it was just too much money. And so you say we, was that a band that you put together in the process or? I had had a band. It was the same. I was in a band in um, college. It was just my name playing my music and stuff. And then yeah. I continued. I was in New York uh, after after graduating from Berkeley in 2006. I moved to New York City okay. um, and then just kind of like exclusively did that for three or four years. And um, like my album, my second album got picked up by Blackheart Records, which is Joan Jett's label. And so like things were going really well and I needed to needed to tour and expand my market and my listener. Um, and again, this was like before the internet was like everything that it is today. Yeah. So, you know, I couldn't afford to bring my band on tour with me. And somebody had suggested that I check out live as an alternative to bringing like physical musicians. And I think at the time they had meant it like, oh, just play to tracks or whatever. Then I just, it just like opened up this whole other dimension of possibilities for me as a performer. And as a composer, because like those those two acts are very nonlinear. And like mm -hmm. when you're given an environment where that like mimics that concept, um, it was just, you know, like a really pivotal thing in my life to be given this tool. And I just sort of like never looked back. And then I've just been an electronic musician ever since. And I've never been in a band <laughs> again. <Yeah. laughs> no, honestly, that's that's a good story. I can relate with that on so many levels. Um, from the simple fact of like just being self-taught in a lot of ways and um, not being able to afford a band and kind of having to become that one-man band and figure out how to pull off your music that you've written with other people by yourself, which... Yeah, it was fun. And at that first tour, I was a trio. It was me, a drummer, and a guitar player. And then I was playing bass with my left hand like a Nord keys with my right hand and it was like an APC 40 and I was singing. So I was running live playing bass and keys um, oh, cool. with two other people. And then I've done like duos, just like me and a guitar player. And like, it's, it's had many different iterations, but more recently it's just myself. Yeah. And I've seen some of your YouTube videos of you using the push and playing live. And then how did you get involved into teaching at Berkeley? So you talked about going to Berkeley and now you're actually teaching there. So how did that kind of happen? I had been working for Ableton for a couple of years um, as a freelancer. And there was a time when they were looking for somebody to be a brand manager for the Northeast. And mm -hmm. I had agreed to like be the, in the position for a, a certain amount of time. And then they were going to hire somebody else to do it. So right around then, that was when Push One came out. And, you know, I was one of the artists they used to do the whole tour of the U.S. for Push One. And a lot of it just was what now is, you know, I see it as teaching. But at the time, it didn't I didn't realize that that's what it was. Um, but it's like, you know, going to guitar centers, doing retail trainings, like showing people how to talk about the device, showcasing it in a musical capacity, going to universities, talking about you know, how it's what like its uses and functionality. So I guess I had been doing it sort of inadvertently for Ableton for a long time, even though I saw it more as just like working, I guess, or being sure. myself. Um, yeah. And I had come up to Berkeley to show them push. This must have been 2012, maybe even no, maybe 2013. I don't know. Um, and so I reconnected with a number of people that I had been, you know, friendly with when I was there beforehand. And somebody just said, you know, you should go speak to this woman. Her name is Bonnie Hayes and she's the new chair of the songwriting department. I know you got a songwriting degree. You know, she's like a big time writer, producer. You should go, you should go meet with her. And so I, I randomly did like, she happens to be free. And, um, she offered me a job like the day, the moment she met me. 
Nice. Which was weird because <laughs> yeah. I didn't I didn't take it very seriously. She I, I thought it was like more of a humorous thing, like, oh, you know, do you need a job? I'm like really looking for somebody with your skill set. That's great. And I thought, ha ha ha. That's an <laughs> um, easy interview. <laughs> I know. Well, and then and then she called me maybe a few months later and she's like, I'm actually like really serious about this. I have a position yep. for you. Would you like to come up and like do this at Berkeley? Sure. Because they needed somebody who really understood songwriters and songwriting, um, but also had like a very strong grasp on the technology side. So, yeah. you know, I was brought here for that specific reason to sort of like bring the songwriting department into the 21st century and create curriculum that like reflected who these students really were. No, that's very cool. I mean, Berkeley definitely has a reputation for, uh, some really high quality training and it brings and attracts a lot of really skilled and talented musicians for sure. Um, but that's a good transition. You talked about teaching with songwriting and, and teaching at Berkeley. Um, I know you've taught music production to a lot of people. I kind of want to dive in with this episode and kind of pick your brain on that process of songwriting and producing, what that looks like for you and some of the things that you teach. So with that, what are some of the biggest struggles that you've seen that comes along with songwriting that you just see with the people that you're teaching? Maybe they're just starting out. Maybe, you know, they're just getting going with Ableton Live. What are some struggles that you see for artists writing music that are common? I think that probably on both sides, it's about internal narrative. <laughs> so for a writer, you know, I think that in some ways people are just like inherently good at writing or they aren't like you can you can you can give people skills and tools to improve like what they were given um and some people are, work really really hard uh, and then others don't and that's like that's where i think the struggle is is where people don't tell themselves no enough it's like a lot of times writers especially if you're a younger writer you you get kind of caught up in the moment and that feeling of being inspired and go with like the first thing that comes out of your mouth or to mind and usually that's not the best thing you could come up with and so you know okay. people need to pra practice saying like no i can do better i can do better than that no no yeah. so i just see a lot of like really talented people not reaching their full potential because they're not willing to say no i can do better or work harder or rewrite or like really really dig in and try things a number of ways and like see what actually is working because i so like in some ways that's laziness i think but it's also just like a mental a mental thing you know where you're like oh that's so great that's it I'm, and then you know somebody suggests you change it and you're like I can, there's no changing it <laughs> <laughs> um, like no that would be way too much work i'll just have to oh no just, just like you're wrong why would i do that you know yeah, but yeah. it's just Keep the difference between mind. Who are you making music for? Is it for other people to listen to and enjoy and digest and understand? Or is it just for you? Like, if it's just for you, then whatever. But if you want to be better at writing, you have to say no. You have to start saying no to yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah and then for, on the production side, it's just like for writers, you don't necessarily perceive yourself as a producer. And I think especially for women, it's really difficult to say the words and like mean it. I'm a producer. Um, and I think writers have that problem. And so it prevents them from like fully embracing the role because it's difficult for them to cross that barrier to say like, I'm a writer to I'm a producer. Yeah. I think it depends on who the person is like that word producer is so loosely thrown around. Yeah. You know, it's like there could be somebody who, you know, is just amateurishly or leisurely making beats right like and then right. putting them on soundcloud and they'll be like i'm a producer right and and they and they, and they mean it in a, in a certain way um versus you know somebody who just has a vision and like takes music and sees it to its most optimal form it's just, it means so many different things so i guess it depends on like who you who you ask right yeah no i've heard both terminology thrown around pretty loosely but I liked what you said earlier is being able to say no in the sense of like, I can do better. Um, I know for me personally, there's been a ton of songs that I wrote and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And then I go pick it up later and I'm like, that was total crap. Like I could totally do much better than that. And, and having feedback, I think is really important in that songwriting process from people that you trust. Um, for me in my own personal experience, I think that's huge. 
for artists to not just get landlocked in their own heads of writing something and then just being like, yep, that's it. And moving on, but actually getting feedback and collaboration is key is something I always tell my students as well. Um, for people who maybe are hitting writer's block, I think that's the word we've all heard before. Um, you know, I'm sure you've experienced and everybody listening has experienced that moment of where they're writing something and maybe they hit that no moment of like, no, I could do better, but maybe they don't know how. Um, what are some ways that you have found or tips that you've discovered for overcoming songwriting block or writer's block or whatever you want to call it? Well, you know, I work a lot, so I constantly have to be outputting. And sometimes I just don't feel like it. And I have to just respect those moments and say, you know, now is not the time to be doing this. Now is not the time to be working on this and just setting it aside for later. So sometimes just stopping trying. If the, I mean, for me, I think that's the right answer because I, I don't have the option of not doing it. So it's like, <laughs> it's like just not right now, you know, it has yeah. to be, it has to be my answer and just yeah. like allowing that and, and just respecting that sometimes my, my brain needs space and my like creative well might need to be filled yeah. if you, if you will. Um, yeah. And not feeling bad about that. You know, it's like, I think that's what really freaks people out. They're like, Oh, I can't figure it out. Like it's gone. I can't, I'll never write again yeah. or, or I've forgotten yeah. how to do it. And yeah, I, I used to really beat myself up a lot if I was, if I was struggling. Um, but you know, it's like inspiration comes when you're at peace with, with, with your environment. Yeah. And cause you know, my, my feeling is that we're just really like catalysts for, communication in a way and so usually if i'm not if i'm not feeling it it's it's because like i'm tired or i'm mm -hmm. i'm stressed out and like the only way to really get back to basics is by just Take, taking a nap <laughs> taking time like a couple sometimes it's a couple days and yeah. coming back to it and it's you know also in times of like real crises i've gone through a program called the artist way which is a book um, by this woman named Julia Cameron. And she's like the, you know, authority on creative blockage and stuff like that. So sometimes I'll, you know, revert back to some of the techniques and tools that she talks about to, you know, stay creatively focused. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of that book again? The Artist's Way. The Artist's Way. Do you remember any, some of the things that she said in there, like specific to do's? Yeah. Um, I think the two most effective tools, um, well, the, the first one's called morning pages and it's, it's the idea that like you wake up and you've got a lot of things to think about every day, you know, like, what are you going to be doing that day? What happened yesterday? Um, the thing that's been bothering you for however long, what are you going to wear? What are you going to eat? Um, so if you, if you wake up and you start every day by just kind of like clearing out those cobwebs, like addressing whatever the, you know, the cloudiness that is yeah. happening and whatever it is that you need to just take a moment and focus on and then let go. And then you throw them away. So after you get through three pages of just like, blah, 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 not even yeah. necessarily journaling, but just like getting it out of the way yeah, and then throwing the pages away. Uh, if you if you do that every morning for a while, like even just five six days, it makes such a huge impact on you know because nice. then you can spend the rest of your day just like be being more in the moment. Not to say that it's like the answer, but right. you yeah. can you can just have already thought about that shit. I and call that brain dumping, and brain I, dump. brain, I brain dump every morning. I just journal and I just write down my thoughts and relax. And you're right, it makes a huge difference for the rest of the day. Yeah, brain journaling dump. is powerful. Um, I don't do it. Like I go through phases, you know, where they'll be like yeah. six months if I'm working through something. Um, yeah. But yeah. So, and then the other technique is called um, the artist date <laughs> where you like, you take your inner artist, right? Cause there's like many people that live inside of you. There's like the inner critic, like mm -hmm. the person who tells you you're not good enough. And then there's yeah. that artist as well. Who's just like, you know, unbound by rules and right. loves to be, you know, ephemeral. So 
the concept is that you need to spend time with your inner artist and like nurture that relationship by taking them out to see things that they might find interesting or like it's like going on a long walk but the the crux of this is that you do it all by yourself right so okay. you go to a movie alone or you go to an art museum alone and you do all these things and you're just like sort of forced to be with yourself have and you it's seen, it's weird to do it have you ever seen the animation movie called inside out that's, i don't think so that's kind of how i'm envisioning what you're talking about right now <laughs> it's like it's like the, all the characters are these emotions in this girl's head. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's like that's what I'm envisioning right now is like you're yeah, taking yourself on a date. It's like all these little animation characters in your head and you're just like trying to, to make sense of them all. It's, yeah. Well, it's true. You know, yeah. and like if your artist is happy, then you're going to be, you know, you're going right. to be able to write or to be right. creative. Good. That's good advice. I'll check out that book. It sounds interesting. Yeah, it's great. Um, so we talked a little bit about songwriting, writer's block. For people that are saying just getting into music production, what are some of the tools that they absolutely need outside of the realm of just being in an emotionally good place and you know being in touch with yourself <laughs> and all that stuff, all the yoga that's involved in good music production, like outside of that, let's get a little nerdy. So let's talk about what are some tools that producers, obviously Ableton Live, this is an Ableton Live podcast, assuming they're using Ableton, what are some things that they could be doing or things they could be buying to make great music? What are, what are the essentials? You know, I feel like you don't really need, you don't really need much. You know, you could, you could do it with nothing. And I, I look, my ethos of teaching, especially beginners is that it's more about application than information. So you know, focusing on the outcome or the desired result, which is like maybe writing a song or maybe producing a beat or, or whatever that is. Like all you need to do is to get access to whatever those tools are that are going to let you do that. So like maybe it's FL Studio, maybe it's GarageBand, maybe it's a web-based music making application, right? Um, maybe it's a full on like live suite with all sorts of controllers and, and whatever. Um, yeah but you just need to have whatever's going to allow you to be musical and start making music and like getting excited about that i think is number one yeah and you know and then as you expand from there i think that it's just like piece by piece grabbing the different information that you need for whatever part of your journey that you're on so in some ways that might be like a basic understanding of music theory right and then for somebody else it might just be like mixing because that's it's, that's more what they're interested in so yeah you know i i think that and, and it doesn't have to be like you need to have this or you need to have that i think what really matters especially when it comes to to stuff is a true understanding of the mechanisms behind the devices so yeah. it's like you could buy all sorts of stuff but if you don't actually understand how any of it works then there's just no point in having any of it. So, you know, totally. first, first off, it's like you get whatever DAW or, you know, whatever interface you're going to be using to create music. Okay. Um, and then un understand it, figure out what you need to know next and like gathering that little bit of information and like slowly expanding and expanding and like given years and years, then all of a sudden you have this gigantic knowledge base and you've probably run across tools that you you know suit your purpose and what it is that you need to do um so like the opposite of this which is i think a lot of people want answers like what should i buy how do i what do i need to know um it's like if you're approaching if you're approaching something from a musical place then what i had just described is the answer to that it's like what is your vision what is it you're trying to say what kind of sounds do you want to make and then you search you search out the answers to that um, but a lot of people want to come at it from a technical place. And it's like, right. I don't know the answer to that because I, I've never understood technology for technology's sake. Um, yeah. And like when I see that, it, it just doesn't feel authentic to me. Yeah. And, you know, I guess like the, the freelancer in me wants to be like, you should be buying Moog products. You should be buying <laughs> Rolly product, you know, but it's like, right. it's not right. for everybody. Like those are right. things that I like to use. Right. Um, they're fun toys. Yeah. I mean, they're forms of expression, right? Yeah. 
what are what are the pieces of gear that you personally use that you really love that you stand behind mm. for producing I, and performing you know i really like I can see a bag next to you with like. No, I know. I have this is like, I just came back. I was trying to think like. Toys over there. Just start with that. Things had started. I mean, I'm always using push and live, is the kind of like brain of it all, right? Um, But from there, the stuff that I've been like excited about lately is, you know, in analog synthesis inside of a live performance format because it's kind of like writing a like a bowl or something um it's i've never heard of analog synthesis being related to writing well it depends on what you're doing you know it's like <laughs> this stuff is is alive right and if you're not really in control of how the signal flow and the parameters are connected to each other then it's gonna sound like shit right yeah. so i've been doing a lot of like sending sequences to pieces of analog gear and then doing a lot of like knob twiddling, but trying to be as like musical as I possibly can so that it's like performative. And that's really been stretching me as a, as a sound designer and a performer. What what kind of synth are we talking about here? What do you use? Um, Well, for the the live rig, a lot of what I've been using a minotaur and then I just got a siren. Um, And the reason I, I have some other, analog p gear but i like to use those because they'll receive uh cc messages so i can make really interesting connections between um like digital hardware and analog hardware so i can get them to talk to each other in in a way that like is because becomes gestural right so like as i'm pressing or pushing or pulling the sound is changing mm-hmm. um and then some some just general analog pedals to like overdrive um phasing flanging hmm. via pedals and also running? a lot of the rolly stuff yeah really makes cool stuff so are you running your analog synth through those pedals yeah mm-hmm. okay that's it that's cool i get some really interesting sounds out of that and yeah are you and are you setting up like an external instrument on a MIDI track in Ableton? And that's how you're getting the audio through Ableton? Yep. So all of the, I mean, I, I'm really close with Apogee and I, I love their products. So I'm always using like Apogee preamps and converters. Um, but basically the signal flow is that MIDI data is leaving push, going through my computer, being sent to the Minotaur, and a lot of times I'm sending additional CC messages. So like I'll assign after touch to modulate cutoff frequency on the filter, let's say. So as I'm pressing down, the sounds are changing. Audio is then coming out of the Minotaur, going into the overdrive pedal, going into the flange. Um, I think that's all I'm using right now. And then that's coming into the, I'm using an element 24, it's a Thunderbolt uh, interface from Apogee and then that's coming back into the computer as both as audio. So on a single track, I'm sending MIDI and receiving audio. Yeah, that's cool. I have a somewhat similar setup with my Moog sub 37, um, without the guitar pedals, but yeah, it's very cool. And you should get that overdrive. It is like life changing yeah. for analog synthesis. Yeah. Analog overdrive oh, like yeah. that. It's so good. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I love overdrive pedals. Guitar pedals are always fun. When I'm in the box, I like guitar rig a lot, um, but it's not the same. Yeah. Um, do you ever play with pedal with Ableton 10? That's, yeah. That has an overdrive in it. Yeah. The audio effect. That thing I mean, is pretty I cool. Just... I enjoy that. I love that thing on on guitar or a synth. But I mean, for hardware junkies, it, it's definitely not the same. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're starting with a... A VI, I think that, you know, digital distortion is totally great. But like if you're starting from an, an analog place, like it just feels wrong to me to just digitally distort an analog signal. So, um, you know, I guess that's where I draw the line. <laughs> tomatoes, tomatoes. It really <laughs> depends. You talked about your setup with your hardware and your synth. Um, do you use anything else for live? I know that you sing. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what that looks like with your vocal setup. Um, sure. It's just a 
using a Telefunken M80 live on stage. It's like this custom purple joint. You've all you've seen them because Beyonce uses them on stage. So um, no, but we all, all want to be like Beyonce. Exactly. <laughs> it's a great mic. It, it they're like they claim that it sounds like a condenser, but it's a dynamic mic. So it's it's really that's the chain that makes a big difference is an, a nicer mic, especially for live stuff through the through the Apogee. Um, like I'm already off to a really great start in in that regard. And then for live effects, I, I do very little spectral or dynamics processing live because depending on the space or what's going on, it could be like kind of a disaster, especially live compression. So I don't really compress or EQ. Like maybe I'll do a slight boost in the high end, but that's it. And then the real effects processing is all time-based. So reverbs, delays, again, more like phasing flanging or like dual harmonizing things that are things that are a little bit more creative and then very little like utilitarian processing. Yeah. Do you send when you play live, do you send your mix stereo out to the person running sound or the soundboard or do you send things out separately? Again, it just depends. I don't play gigs in like a traditional sense anymore. I stopped doing that four years ago, I decided I didn't want to anymore. And so when I'm performing, it's usually like at festivals, right? Like I just did Moog Fest or I'll do Gear Fest every year or NAM, yeah. um, or on stages at school, I'll do a lot of like faculty stuff or I perform in class a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so like, depending on that situation, I'll format and like send out different signals depending on what I think is the right choice, you know, and it, it would be different when I was touring a lot. I'd have, I'd have basically two versions of the setup. One that was just a stereo output. And then one that was like everything split out so that I could send it to a sound engineer, but like not everybody, not, not everybody can handle that from the front of house perspective. Yeah. Um, especially if it's like a smaller little spot. So mm -hmm. be flex. I'm flexible in that regard. It's good. It's good to be flexible. Well, let's talk about your Beats by Girls. Uh, I know that's something that you've invested in and seems like it's continued to grow. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what that is and how that got started. Sure. Uh, Beats by Girls was really just like an evolution of the way people were perceiving me because you know, I was like an early adopter of some of these tools and more more so stuck out because I was a singer songwriter doing them. And so a lot of other performers and writers um, who were wanting to do what I was doing on stage were, were like hiring me to teach them the skill set to produce in live or or take these like largely electronic tracks that they had either because they were working with a producer or they had made them themselves and like find ways to perform them. Um, and it, you know, like all of my students were women. And that was like when I really transitioned away from being on stage was because people just wanted that information from me. And it wasn't necessarily something I set out to do. Um, but, you know, at one, one point, I just realized that I wasn't very happy doing the artist thing anymore. And that, you know, people really wanted to perceive me as an educator and a teacher or like somebody who was going to make other people feel safe and comfortable when learning new skills like this. So I just, you know, said, all right, let's just do this on purpose instead of on accident. And, you know, the, the, the publicist I had been working with at the time, he's like a branding guru. And it was, it was just an idea that came out of a meeting that we had where we were talking about this exact topic saying, you know, like, who are you really? <laughs> and, you know, once we decided to do that, we were like, okay, we're going to create something just for young women and see what kind of an impact we can make there. And that was in 2013. And so this is our sixth year. And we went from just having one chapter in New York City to now we have 17 globally. And there's, you know, three chapters in Europe right now. And, one opening in South Africa wow. and That's yeah, awesome. it's really great. So, you know, it's, it's nice to look back and say like, right. I did it. So 
So this is kind of your baby you started and you're overseeing other women who are training other women. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Like how so there's you three other women. Happen? What does that look like? Yeah. There's three other women that work for the global organization. Um, have you ever heard of girls rock club yes. or, or like rock camp or whatever mm -hmm. rock school of rock. There we go. School of rock, yeah. um, With Jack Black. School. <laughs> yes. Exactly <laughs> like that. Except Just for like, digital. Right. For women. Um, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's the same concept where it's like, we're, we are the template. We, we provide a lot of resources to regional groups of women who want to start chapters in their own communities um, so we can help them get access to technology, whether it's hardware, software, create internal partnerships will help them like find fundraising opportunities locally. We provide them with curriculum, um, but largely each group is sort of autonomous. You know, it's like they're advertising to their own community and to their own teachers. So we, you know, it's, it's kind of hands off, but we, we do help them a lot with things that people would find difficult when starting something like this. Okay. And this is like mostly in person or online or both. It's all the classes are in person. So some, some of the chapters it's like after school programming, um, once a week, you know, they go to, they go to classes. Sometimes it's camps. Some of the chapters are actually like inside of schools themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, whatever, whatever fits in. So you've helped create like a really great network that allows people to locally basically reach their goals, producing music in whatever fashion it is specifically for women, which is really cool. I, um, I think, you know, who Julie Catherine is, um, the artist, yeah. I am snow angel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had her on the podcast not too long ago and she was talking about you. Um, I think you did some work with her. Is that right? Or yeah. I mean, Julie is one of those women who wanted me to show her how to do it. She was, she was a client of mine for like a year and a half. And when I, when I first met her, she was like this Americana singer songwriter. And you could see she was really excited about this other thing that she was, she was producing beats and logic, or maybe it was even garage. No, I think it was logic. Um, but she didn't really know what was going on, but she felt like musically excited by that. And so I worked with her for a year and a half and it was on everything from like just general music technology skill building to what eventually was like, I helped to build and curate her entire live rig and produce, you know, her earliest shows where it was yeah. like my work. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and she's killing it. She's, she's got a strong yeah. fan base and she's playing yeah. a lot of shows and that's exciting. I'm sure for you to be able to see somebody kind of grow in that sense with their live shows and know that you were a big part of that. That's totally. Awesome. She's a super hard worker and yeah, I've been lucky to have a lot of different artists like that, that I've been able to have an impact on. That's really cool. Um, well, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Uh, I want to respect your time. Everybody go check out Aaron's uh, music and check out what you're doing. If if people want to stay connected with you and learn more about you, where can they stay connected with mm, other projects? And great happening? question. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty active on the gram. Yeah. Instagram. It's just my name, Aaron Barra. Okay. Or, or Facebook also. It's Mama Barra, M-A-M-M-A-B-A-R-I. <laughs> yeah. That. And that, <laughs> I, you know, I'm always like posting about where I'm teaching or what's going on and it's hard to miss me. You just gotta take a look go hit up mama Barra and <laughs> uh yeah thanks aaron for joining the podcast some good things and um i think it's exciting to see the community that you've built around beats by girls and everything you're doing helping artists basically make their dreams a reality and how they're pulling off producing music in different fashions and i think it's cool keep killing it thanks for joining <laughs> the podcast uh, yes, is there anything else welcome. you wanted to say before we sign off no, just, you know, keep making music. Follow your ears, everybody. Follow your ears and your dreams. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Follow both. Well, thanks, Aaron. Have a great evening. Um, maybe we'll have you back on the podcast again another day. Uh, yeah, we'll see you again soon. See ya. All right, thanks. This podcast is sponsored by LiveProducersOnline.com, a community of Ableton Live users connecting you to the pros to learn today's music production.